much, Deborah. Um, welcome everyone to our AGR book club today, featuring child survivor Jack Young and historian Dr. Rebecca Clifford. My name is Bea Lefkowitz and I'm the director of the AGR Refugee Voices Archive. I'm delighted to be here with you today on the eve of the Jewish festival Hanukkah. The theme we're going to discuss this afternoon, the lives of the child survivors of the Holocaust is of particular poignancy. It does seem to me like a small miracle that young children such as Jackie did survive and that they're here to tell us their stories, even if they cannot remember what happened to them. Today, we will first hear from Jackie, who will tell us a bit more about himself, and we will then have a conversation with Rebecca, who will talk about her absolutely wonderful book, Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust. In case you haven't seen it, here it is. I just want to say this at the outset. This is a must read. Uh, it's much more than a piece of historical writing, as Rebecca very skillfully weaves her own reflections about memory and testimonies into the narrative. And I really, really enjoyed reading her book. So uh, uh, an absolute recommendation for me. The theme of child survivors and child refugees is very pertinent for the AGR Refugee Voices Archive. Out of 250 interviewees, 102 interviewees were under the age of 18 at the end of the war. 100 out of 250, that's a, it's a very large number. And 36 were under the age of 10 in 1945. Seven of our interviewees were born between 1940 and 1945. And I saw Eva Clark is here with us this afternoon. She is the youngest uh, interview in our archive, uh, born in Mauthausen concentration camp five days before liberation. Jackie is one of the seven interviewees and we were privileged to interview him in 2015. He has a very moving and difficult story to tell and I'm delighted that he is with us, uh, with us today. Um, Jackie, so we're going to start with you. I'll just introduce you a little bit and then we hear from you directly. Jackie Young was born Jona Spiegel in Vienna on the 18th of December, 1941. At the age of nine months, he was deported from a Jewish orphanage to Theresienstadt. After the liberation of Theresienstadt in May, 1945, Jackie was brought with other young children who were all around three to four to five to Bulldogs Bank in Sussex which some of you may have seen in the film, uh, which was featured in the, in the Windermere Children. And I'm going to share the screen now. I want to just show you a few photos. Um, of Jackie. Um, and here you can see some photos of Jackie and uh, on the, the two buildings here um, are uh, the, the, the places where Jackie stayed. So uh, he was first in Bulldogs Bank where he stayed about a year. Uh, and later on he and the other children were, um, went to Weir Courtney. And the children were looked after among others by Alice Goldberger and Sophie and Gertrude Dunn. And Jackie will tell us a little bit more about the photos in a little while. Jackie was a London black cab taxi driver for 46 years, and he and his wife Lita have two daughters. And Jackie's story is one of the stories featured in Rebecca's book. Um, so Jackie, maybe before we see you full screen, tell us a little bit more about the photos we can see. Okay, the one in the top left-hand corner is uh, of us five children, I believe there. I'm in the very front with my curly hair, haven't changed a bit. And uh, in the middle one on the top, I'm on the far left corner. I think this shot was taken in Windermere. Uh, on the right with the, uh, with the bow tie is a picture with my, when my foster parents who became my adopted parents uh, had me taken this little silk shirt and a bow tie. Uh, and the bottom in the middle is my adopted parents, Ralph Young and Annie. Helen Young, and I'm there in the middle. Uh, as you said, there's on the far left corner is Bulldogs Bank and Weir Courtney. One year in Bulldogs Bank, and I was, that was one of my big memories, Bulldogs Bank. Uh, other than that, that's about it. Thank you. I will stop screen sharing now. Thank you very much, Jackie. Jackie, just tell us a little bit, please, about your experiences um, of 
Well, what I'm about to tell you is that it was a total shock to me about my past. Around nine years old, a child came up to me and said I was adopted. I had no knowledge of this whatsoever. Went to my adopted parents who were actually fostering me just, just prior to being officially adopted. And I said that some a boy said I was adopted. Uh, and uh, they eventually, the following day, with a lot of friends around, they came clean and said, yes, you're right. You, you were adopted, but, and I felt, you know, they're the only people I knew. So I, I felt uh, I was very close to them. So I told them I loved them. Then another little bit of information came in my teens when I went around to my grandmother. She uh, uh, said to me one, uh, in passing, she said, I don't know, Jackie, but you, you don't know that you're Austrian. I said, oh, am I? So with that, uh, I left her and on the bus, something to myself, uh, do I sound like German or something? Anyway, I said, I said this to my uh, then adopt, uh, my adopted parents saying that, well, my father went absolutely bare and said to me, uh, who told you this? And I said, um, well, it was, uh, I was scared to tell them because I knew that if I told him, he'd be uh, uh, very annoyed. Anyway, after a little while, he, uh, he eventually prized the knowledge out of my head and I told her who told me and he, he stormed out and must have told his mother what, uh, you know, really terrible thing. And the final bombshell, what I call it a bombshell, was that when I was about to get married, I had to prove that I was Jewish and uh, they demanded to have the papers to prove it. So it, my, my adopted mother had them at the safe deposit box, all the papers about me. I, uh, and I snatched the papers from her when, I, when I, it was revealed that, that my mother was Jewish. And so the, he said, yes, it's okay. You get married in a proper synagogue, United synagogue. And I, that's when I found out that I was uh, actually in a, concentration camp for two years, eight months, which I had absolutely no knowledge of. And basically that's my story. And I'll be living with that for a long time. And how did it impact you when you when you found that out, that you had well, been uh, I'm shocked. Uh, the major problem is I had wonderful doting adopted parents but who could not handle at all my past and that was the sort of wedge that uh, got bigger as we went along my father could never listen to me uh, to ask if I had any questions he would he would just walk out and my my mother kept on saying you want to hurt us you know and they were very doting parents I had uh, ridiculous things I had a car when I was a brand new big console uh, 17 I, you know and I, I had holidays I had money uh, I, did, I had not a care in the world I was living in la la land but didn't realize the full tragedy of my past mm -hmm. and later what did you find out about your parents well uh, my birth parents I found out that uh, my mother for whatever reason in Vienna on my birth certificate omitted my father's name now it's been suggested he may have not been Jewish and that's why she didn't or other things I have subsequently looked into my DNA and asked the DNA for my paternal side and it was suggested uh, without them having any knowledge of my past saying that uh, you have a substantial amount of uh, Ashkenazi blood on your paternal side. So it's possible that he was Jewish, uh, who may have been, uh, uh, what I say, a person who disguised themselves as being Jewish or may have been, uh, you know, changed to a Catholic or something like that. But other than that, uh, so, uh, but my entire family, uh, at the age when I went to Theresienstadt, were basically dead. Uh, but uh, my wife and I have, uh, uh, my big uh, motion, uh, move was when we first, I think it was we got married, we went, um, 
I asked my father, because I used to get dreams about things and particularly Weir Courtney, and I could describe it uh, totally. And uh, I said to my father, where is this place? I keep dreaming this thing. And um, eventually he eventually said to me where he thought it was. So I went down there with my wife and uh, we found Weir Courtney, which was, uh, uh, you could say was uh, quite traumatic because um, my, uh, <laughs> I welcomed you in. <laughs> okay, we have room. We have time. Uh, my dreams came to reality. <laughs> Uh, the people at Weir Courtney helped me, helped us in. They welcomed us. They had two lovely girls and showed us around. And as I say, it was uh, amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for sharing your part of the story. And I think it, it links, it brings us straight to Rebecca's work because it shows how difficult it was and how 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 your your parents your foster parents didn't really know what you know how to deal with, with they, they with weren't the, a, Alice Goldberger suggested to help them but she, they declined and I think that's if you could say it they, they just weren't equipped to handle people like ourselves really I think I think Rebecca knows that more than yeah. I do yeah, so that's in fact what Rebecca's book is about. So thank that's you exactly. for, for the time being. Okay. I hope we will get more questions at the end. Thank you so much. Um, let me now introduce, please, uh, Rebecca Clifford. Uh, Dr. Clifford received an, a DPhil in Modern History from the University of Oxford in 2008 and joined the History Department in Swansea in 2009. Her chief research interests are 20th century European history, oral history, Holocaust history and memory studies. Her most recent research project explored child survivors and Holocaust memory, resulting in the publication of the book I just showed you, Survivors Children's Life After the Holocaust, published by Yale University Press in 2020. The book has been nominated, uh, not to my surprise, for a number of leading prizes in the field, including the Wingate Prize, Wolfson History Prize, and the Bailey Gifford, Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. Rebecca, thank you very much for agreeing to, um, to speak to us today. Um, maybe we can start, if you could please tell us the historical background for your book to set the scene, but also tell us what motivated you to explore the story of the, of the theme of child survivors. Um, and then maybe later go on a bit to tell us what was the most surprising um, aspect of your research. By all means. First of all, I just need to say a lot of thank yous. Um, thank you so much to the AJR and to all of you who are hosting this event and running this event. I can't tell you how much it means to me to see all of you on the screen because as I look out, I actually see many people I interviewed for the book. So I want to specific, I it's hard, I can't see all of you at once, but um, I see Vera, I see Joan, I see, I'm going, I'm flipping through. I see Joanna, I see Hanukkah, I see Henry. I'm so sorry if I'm missing anybody. I'm having a look as we go. Um, I'm sure there must be others. And it's, I've of course never ever had the chance to be together with you. And of course I'm not together with you because I'm sitting in my daughter's bedroom in Swansea, but I wish so much we were sitting down together today. Uh, because for many of you, I haven't seen you since um, we, we talked together in 2014 and that's six years now. And I also have to say to Jackie, I mean, anyone who's read the book knows that Jackie's story is in the book a lot. And that's because I um, was so very struck, uh, not just by uh, an interview I, I did with Jackie back in 2014, but Jackie has written a memoir, which I consider to be a, a truly extraordinary piece of writing. 
And it's about what he's just described, you know, about this l- slow drip of learning the facts about his early years and what that felt like to him. Um, and in that way, I, I, um, I, I think I lived with Jackie's story and it became part of my life for a long time too. And right now when he was talking, look, I know Jackie's story, but I, it was as if the whole rest of the world just fell away right then. And I was crying with Jackie and um, Jackie's story is, is so meaningful to me, but actually everybody here who I interviewed, your stories are so meaningful to me. So let me say a little bit about why I wrote the book. Um, Cause actually it's not, it's maybe not all that straightforward. Like, I mean, I guess the obvious reason is there is no book written by a historian about child survivors that looks at their lives after the war. And so in that sense, I wanted to be the one to write that book. I thought that book needed to be written. And not only child survivors after the war, but what happened to these children who survived the Holocaust in those seven decades? Of course, the, the war ended now um, 75 years ago. So what has life looked like for child survivors as they grew up and became teenagers and young adults and moved through their lives and and had their own children and retired. And I mean, this, we're talking about the course of human life. So, so that was a story that, that no historian has ever told. And I, I really felt it, it needed to be told. But I actually don't think that was the main thing that drove me. So I am, I am an oral historian, which means I, I do all my work. Like Bea, I do my work by interviewing people, which is a really great joy and an extraordinary privilege. And um, I've been interviewing people for, you know, for more than a decade now. And I thought for a long time to myself about how we tell our stories. And I actually did, um, uh, before, long before I started this project, did a big project with 14 other historians on um, student activism in the 60s. So a really different topic. But we each did about 50 interviews for, in in kind of uh, 14 different countries, we each did 50 interviews for that project. And I got really um, curious about, like how people tell their stories and especially where do you start your story like if I come with my recording equipment and I sit down with you and I say uh, Bea tell me your life story what are you going to start with well most people start with my parents were this and this is the town I was from and and we tell this origin story of our lives but for child survivors of the holocaust they often don't know the fundamental details about that origin story and I thought okay if you don't know who your parents were or you don't really know where you came from how do you make sense of your life how do you tell the story of who you are so that was really the main thing that that I wanted to explore in the in the book because I think I had never until I started writing this book thought it's actually quite a privilege to be able to tell your own life story and um I I have thought about that a lot over the six years it took me to write it. Um, Those of us who are lucky enough to be able to know those early facts of our lives, most people take it for granted. Don't think twice about the fact that I can tell you who my parents are or my siblings or can tell you about the town I came from. But actually it's an extraordinary privilege. And I think we do well to think about what happens when when you don't know that. What do you what do you do to to get that information? How far are you willing to go? What does it mean when you can't find it? Um, so that's a bit of the um, the background about why I wrote the book, and a little bit about the historical background as as well. Hopefully, I mean I think what's interesting you mentioned the fact that as an oral historian, how would you interview somebody who doesn't have memories? You know, it, and that's a contradiction in terms, and it really resonates with me because many many years ago. I did, you know, I did some interviews for the Shaw Foundation and I did interview a child survivor and that was the most difficult interview I'd ever done uh, because she just couldn't remember. And it was, you know, and I, I, it's still in, in, in my mind. Um, and the question to you is, you know, as a, somebody who's done many interviews, how, how do you think, you know, what is the best way to, to record a story without memory or, you know, to, to, to record a fragmented story? Well, there's a, a, cu- a couple of different points there, I suppose. Um, and I've, I've thought about this a lot. I've talked about it with a lot of different audiences too. Like, you know, what, one of the things that's special about 
child survivor's stories is just how fragmented they can be and how many gaps there can be in them. So when you're when you're interviewing, you need to open up space for a conversation that has room for gaps and silences and things that we don't know. Um, I guess the important thing to keep in mind is that when I when I interviewed so many people in in this in this room um, six years ago, I wasn't asking about what happened to them during the war. I mean, we talked about that a little bit, but I really wanted to know about their lives afterwards, all their lives. And sometimes people were surprised. And many people said, well, why do you want to know about that? It's not interesting. But to me, that was the most interesting part. And of course, then the issue of not remembering maybe parts of the war or parts of the early post-war period or anything about that period is not a problem because we were talking about um, you know, uh, your lives as teenagers and as young adults and what it was like when you had children. And so, so those gaps in memory became part of a life story, I think. And I, I had never done interviewing like that before, um, but I think I will always, uh, I will always do interviewing like that in the future because then actually you can talk about the fact that there are absences and gaps. Like Jackie said, he has very few memories of anything except a little blip at, at Bulldog's Bank and Weir Courtney, you know, that lovely lawn of Weir Courtney just sloping away down to the to the racehorse track. And it was actually came to him in his dreams. Well, he wasn't the only one of the child survivors I interviewed who dre dreamt of things that they couldn't actively recall. So this idea of dreams being filled with actually fragments of memory is very evocative. And um, I think you can do the type of interview that that instead of instead of fighting against those gaps in memory, embraces them. You say, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what you don't remember. Um, but a, you know, the a, a, the format of many interviewing um, you know programs doesn't leave space for that. So it was great to be able to do. That. Yes, and, and you've got some interesting examples of uh, at looking up individual interviews where the interviewer really tries to pin it down and the interviewee kind of rejects uh, that. And it's it's really interesting, this whole idea about also framing for each, uh, you know, project. Um, but uh, but before we talk about that, I just wanted to ask you to, to really talk about the history a bit more. Um, in your book, you say we had about, there were about 150,000 child survivors uh, post-war and different agencies thinking about it, doing kind of different things. People were, you know, if you could just tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely, yeah. Sorry, I was thinking of the historiography, but just to give you the sort of general sense of the history of child survivors of the Holocaust, there were um, an estimated 180,000 children who survived the Holocaust. Now, you need to think for a minute about what the term child means. So in that group of 180,000 child survivors. That includes children who are teenagers, of course. It includes children up to the age of 18. But in my book, I only, only wrote about children who um, were born in a period between 1935 and 1944. So what I wanted to ensure was that there was nobody who was any older than, than 10, more or less. There were a few that squeaked in who were older than 10, but the rationale behind that was because I quite wanted to find child survivors who had patchy memories because it's really a book about memory. That's why the you know gaps in memory are part of the book rather than being a problem. So I wanted to find children who had lived, who had had the experience of being in continental Europe during the war, but maybe couldn't piece the whole story together. So that was the, the motivation. So when we're talking about that group of children, we're probably talking about a much smaller group because as you all know, the chances of a very young child surviving the Holocaust were very slim indeed. So of the children in the book, there's a whole range of wartime experiences and post-war experiences. So if we look at the war experiences, we find children who survived in hiding, both with uh, families in the countryside, sometimes with families in the city, sometimes in convents, and lots of different ways to, to go into hiding. Um, we find children who were in, in internment and concentration camps, and certainly those in ghettos as well. And there's a small handful of children who um, managed during the war to get to various safer refuges. Uh, Joan, who's here tonight, and I'm looking at her right now, she's one of them. She met, yeah, she's waving, right? She, she managed um, to escape 
um, to Spain and then to Portugal and then to the United States. Um, there were others who managed to escape to Switzerland, for example. Um, quite a large number managed to flee to the Soviet Union. And so that was another possible um, road to survival, I suppose. And then, there, of course, there were many, many post-war experiences too. And that's part of the reason why I asked about um, you know, post-war post lives is because those those different experiences set people up for very different courses in their lives. So there were um, child survivors who were never separated from their families. So there was, they didn't have to be returned, but there were many, many more who were separated from their parents and were then either found that their parents were no longer alive at the war's end or were returned to a surviving parent or in some cases, fewer cases, both surviving parents or possibly to a relative. There were those who ended up in care homes, uh, as happened to, to Jackie um, and Joanna, who is here as well. Um, and then from a care home, there were different experiences. Some were like, like uh, Jackie and Joanna adopted, some uh, went into foster care, some spent the rest of their childhoods in care homes. And each one of those roads, I suppose, led to a very different experience over the course of, of a person's life. Um, so in a nutshell, that is, the history, it's a very, very um, like complex history. I suppose I should add that all the child survivors I look at, I look at a hundred different stories in the book and all of them end up leaving continental Europe. So there's this other aspect of, of, of being a refugee or at least migration, um, which further complicates a child's story because they need then to learn a new language and a new culture. And for a child who has already experienced a lot of disruption, that can sometimes be the, the final straw, actually. A uh, very disorienting experience of going into a global diaspora. And that leads, uh, that leads me to another issue you discuss in, in your book. And it was something I myself had to do with the issue of names, yeah. uh, what names you're actually using in the book for the people you your interview. Can you just tell us a little bit of, about that? Absolutely, because uh, as I know many of you who, who know me know, um, this was for me ethically one of the most difficult issues I had with the book. So when I wrote the book, and I'm going to say you because so many of you here tonight are in the book, even if I did not write directly about your stories, your stories change the way I think and so you're very much there and you were kind of with me as I wrote so I actually always put everybody's full names in um, when I was writing because that helped me it just helped me make sense of the story really but when it came time to editing the book uh, there were some obviously those legal issues so one of the issues is that I in doing research for the book I I sometimes started with oral history and worked backwards and tried to find archival documents based on the oral history. And sometimes I went the other direction, starting with archival documents and then tried to track down people to interview them or use other interviews that had been conducted with them. And when you use things like um, children's case reports in the archives, you generally have to sign a waiver saying you will never use that child's real name. And I had a really interesting conversation about this topic um, with the archivist at the Canadian Jewish Congress archives in Montreal, because I was signing the waiver and I said, you know, I have a lot of trouble with this. Because if you think about child survivors, they've often lost everything. But they've, you know, they, they've told me their stories, right? In their own name, there was only one person I interviewed um, for this project who didn't want to use their own name. And so if I sign this waiver, I have to strip them of their name. And to me, that feels like robbing them of one of the most precious aspects of their identities. Your story, you should have a right to have your name on your own story. And the um, archivist is a really wonderful person. She said, I never thought about it like that. You know, the reason we do it, the reason we make you sign the waiver is because we had a case of identity theft a few years ago. Someone came into the archive and basically stole the identity of a child survivor and used it to put in a claim for, um, for restitution. And I thought, I never thought about it like that. Sorry, by the way, if you can hear the doorbell ringing in the background, this is, this is just 2020, I guess. Um, I never thought about it the way she was, you know, the issue for her was, was about identity theft and legal aspects. And so finally we got, we reached a compromise. I said, okay. And we talked about it with the publisher as well. 
I will use the children whose stories are in the book, I will use their real birth name and the initial of their original uh, family name if we knew it. And it's like all compromises. I think I was very unhappy with it and probably nobody was happy with it. But my hope was that it would it would help people, first of all, to ident identify their own stories. And then if they had relatives, help their relatives to identify them too. I did have a woman who, who rang me um, um, sort of late in the production process, I suppose. And she said, I need to have my own name in the book because what if relatives are looking for me and they won't be able to find me because they won't recognize you know, my name from just like the, you know, the first name and the initial. And I said, look, I will make sure it's in the bibliography and in the notes because I think I can get away with that. Um, and I really understood. And I still feel strongly. If you told me your story in your own name, you should get to have your own name on it. And I almost feel like I need to say, I'm sorry that I couldn't do that. But I hope that the compromise is not too unsatisfactory. I know as it was because I'm planning on writing uh, another book, at least one more book about child survivors, the issue will come up again. Like all ethical issues is complicated and there, there isn't a, a very happy answer, I suppose. Thank you, Rebecca. Maybe we can discuss at the end how people feel about that. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, it's a very important, anyway, the issue of names, you know, for a lot of the refugees who change their names, it's also very important, a theme. and. I will all remember, always remember, I interviewed a kinder transportee called Fred Barshak. Uh, and he, he said, you know, he was thinking of changing his name. And he was told, don't ever change your name because otherwise your family can't find you. And he never changed his name. Um, you know, I mean, maybe one idea is you could have a website with real names. So anyway, that's, that's to discuss. But I think what comes out of it is that you feel, you, we can feel your, the responsibility you feel towards the stories you collect. And I can relate to that um, because, you know, we, Refugee Voices has collected so many stories and whenever, you know, I just finish a film or make a film or write, you feel, have I represented that person and would the person be happy with it? So I want to ask you how you feel about representing other people's story. And also, you know, not every story, as you said before, made it into the book. You know, how do you feel that, that inevitably you have to, you, you can't cover everything. I think a lot about there's somebody who's here tonight actually um who said to me at the beginning she's one of the first person uh, people I interviewed and she said to me uh, at the beginning it was very helpful for me to hear she's like I just want you to know that the copyright on my story is mine and I was like you you bet it is it's yours I cannot think of anything more precious to you than your story um so when I was writing the book, I tried to tell these stories with as much humanity and empathy as I could. But that that's complicated. Um, there were issues that came up that complicate that both the humanity and the empathy side, I suppose. Um, anyone who's read the book has probably encountered some of them. What do you do, for example, when you have read a, um, a child's uh, case report and then you match it up with their oral history and find that when they were a child, they were totally lying about their life story? Instead of cover up the lie, because the, it was served a very real purpose in, for example, 1948, you talk about why it was necessary to tell the lie, I think. There's a very specific case of um, a person I never managed to uh, interview myself. I think he's passed away now. I, I tried to find him and I failed. Um, but I looked at his case file in the Canadian Jewish Archives um, uh, our, uh, sorry, Canadian Jewish Congress Archives in Montreal. And he, in his case file, there's this whole story as it was like child's, child's story. And there's all these details about the story. And then when he was later interviewed, um, the story he tells about his life, uh, he was interviewed in 1995, I think for the Shoah Foundation collection. And the story he tells about his life is totally different. It's quite clear the later story is actually the true one because what he needed to cover up in 1948 when he was trying to immigrate to Canada on this scheme is the fact that his mother was alive. 
That's because the Canadian scheme um, that took in more than a thousand child survivors uh, up to the age of 18 and sometimes beyond, um, the Canadian scheme did not allow children to emigrate to Canada if they had a surviving parent. So in order to get himself out of the DP camp where he was trapped with his mother really and just to get them moving on to new lives, he lied. And his mother managed to immigrate on a parallel scheme and eventually they, they were back together again and they made their new lives in Canada. And I think how you deal with that is you explain why that was necessary in a way that the reader can understand they would have made the same choice. Any of us would have made the same choice because it was a cruel policy that wouldn't allow a surviving mother to immigrate with her child. And we can see that from our 21st century uh, vantage point. Mm -hmm. Now, the question of um, the stories that didn't make it into the book is a very poignant one because I can see many of you here who I interviewed whose stories are not in the book. And you're probably quite aware of that. And I am quite aware of it too. That was partly because um, it's a long book and it covers a lot of years and a great span of geographical space as well. And at some point I had a wonderful, wonderful editor for the book. Uh, he just, his, his hand is kind of heavy in, in a way because every time I got too theoretical or academic, he was always really firm about dragging me back, I think. And he'd say, no, Rebecca, bring it back to the stories. That is the only really interesting stuff. Never mind all this theory and <laughs> academic stuff, bring it back. Um, and at some point in our discussion, we realized that it worked best for the reader because we were imagining a person reading this book as not being a, a child survivor and not being a historian either, but just being a general interest reader who maybe they were gonna read the book and reflect on their own childhoods. And so we wanted to make sure that there were voices, I guess, that were like threads that ran through the story. So Jackie's is one of those, right? You'll find Jackie's story in many different chapters of the book. And that's just for a sense of continuity. But there was nobody I interviewed whose story didn't help me to understand. I mean, profound, I'm not just saying that. Uh, profoundly changed the way I thought. And every single one of you here who I interviewed whose stories are not told in the book, it doesn't mean I haven't, like, like, I haven't thought very deeply about your stories. And I was, I, I can't, I can't see Hanukkah, but I know she's here. Hanukkah, I know you're here. Um, I was, so she and I were emailing recently because I was saying, Hanukkah, I always felt bad that I didn't tell your story. Actually, it was in an earlier version of the book, but we, when we edited it, it came out. But I was emailing to her saying, in everybody's, in every interview I did, there was always one moment that it blew my mind for, for lack of a better <laughs> descriptor. Hanukkah and I, we talked on the phone actually, so we've never met face to face, um, that she was telling me her story. And she told me this moment. I don't know if you want to come on and tell it, Hanukkah, or if you're okay with me, if, if I tell it. Where is she? Can we see her, Deborah? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can see Hanukkah. Do you want yeah. to tell I know what you're going to say. In 1992, I went to the Hidden Child Conference that took place in Amsterdam. My mother never wanted to talk about the war, but um, and I was born in hiding. And then later I was uh, in a small children's home um, where there were some other Jewish children. And I went to the conference to find out if there was anybody else there and uh, who had also been with Sister Pop, the lady who had the little children's home. And the next thing that happened was my mother turned up, which was a big surprise to well almost a shock in fact that she had come and she came to sit next to me and at a certain moment in the conference the atmosphere changed and I felt I should support my mother and wanted to hold her hand and my mother moved away from me and that still at 77 hurt so deeply I have never really got over it and the lady who organized the conference Nicole David who a lot of you will know from the past and um, Nicole was was sitting on my left and she actually held my hands and that was so powerful and Rebecca brought that out when we were speaking and 
for her to remember that moment is just absolutely amazing. It's the essence of what is so, well, horrible for me, really, because it, it, it meant a, a, almost a rejection. And I think to be rejected by your own parent when you're younger, you don't understand. And I started to understand, but I've never really got over it. Thank you. Thank you, Hanukkah. Hanukkah, thank you so much. I, I, and sorry to put you on the spot, but I just want to tell your story. So, so I interviewed Hanukkah and this story of trying to hold her mother's hand and her mother kind of pulls away. It just said so much to me, not just about Hanukkah's story, but about so many of your stories of that difficult conversation with surviving parents or surviving relatives. And sometimes the just the impossibility of reaching across it. And this was decades later. And it also really, I mean, reminded me very much of my own family, which I think we'll, we'll talk about in a bit, but just how, I mean, Jackie has also spoken of this, just how difficult it can be for a child survivor who's sometimes desperate to want to learn about the past and want to patch up some of those holes. And they're trying to reach out to their surviving parent or their adoptive parent or their foster parent or their surviving relatives and they're being rejected. It's a very, very common experience. And although I didn't write about Hanukkah's story directly in the book in the end, I've never forgotten. I mean, I will never forget that. I never stopped thinking about it. It was like a like a, a, a diamond that perfectly encapsulated that experience, which I see so many of you nodding. You know what that's like. And there were many others. Um, I can see Joan in front of me, so I'm thinking of Joan as well. Aspects of Joan's story that just sat very heavily on me, actually. I thought about them a lot and I still think about them and I will probably always think about them. So all of that is a way of saying, um, if, this, if your story is not written about directly in the book, it has nonetheless changed my life. And it is in the book because the book, I could not make sense not of your individual experiences, but of this collective experience of child survivors without listening to your stories. Rebecca, thank you. I mean, it's, I think you have a whole chapter on, on reunions and mm -hmm. difficult reunions, and it touches upon it. I was, of course, also thinking that that partly applies to kinder transportees and reunion of kinder transport. So one of the questions I was going to ask you how similar or different, uh, and this is interesting for our audience here, is the experience of child survivors and um, and refugees, child refugees, you know, who who left uh, Nazi Europe before the Second World War? So I should start by saying, obviously, I'm not an expert on the kinder transport in the sense that I have. I, there's a few kinder transport uh, children who I did interview, um, but most of those who are in the book. Um, were in continental Europe during the war. And so I haven't just had that experience of sitting and listening to kinder transport stories in the same way. However, having said that, I was thinking earlier, if you can imagine um, a child born in 1935, who is sent on the kinder transport and never sees their parents again. And then imagine a child born in 1935, who like Jackie ends up in Theresienstadt and then comes to Britain after the war on the scheme for concentration, concentration camp survivor children and never sees their parents again. Okay, the different, the experiences are different, but in terms of making sense of the memories, in terms of trying to fill the gaps in your life story, I imagine there's more similarities there than, than differences. Because the not knowing about your childhood, the not knowing your parents, the not knowing your background. I'm sure it sits just as heavily on kinder transport children as it does on child survivors who come out of Europe after the war. And that frustration with the gaps in memory and the silences in fam families as, as Hanukkah has been talking about, that is also something I think will resonate with a lot of kinder transport survivors. Um, I can see some of, some of them in the audience nodding. Um, 
the reason I didn't engage with, um, the reason there aren't really kinder transport um, um, children in the book is because I did want to think about what it meant when you had been through the experience of hiding, been through the experience of, of surviving a concentration camp and had patchy memories the way Jackie had, you know, he can, he can, um, sorry, Jackie, it's not, you're thinking of Bulldog's Bank. I'm thinking of Zenka, who isn't here tonight, that she does have patchy memories. And she's one of the um, child survivors who probably many of you know, and, and somebody I'm in touch with a lot. Um, she does remember Theresian Stat in a patchy sort of way, in a, in an, in a, in a very sens sensorial way, I suppose. And so I did want to capture that in the book, but I feel that I easily could have written this book about kinder transport uh, children as well. Oh, Bea, you're muted. Sorry, I, I just said that I hope at some point somebody will write a, a book like yours, you know, on you know, I think Refugee Voices, we have more than 70 interviews with um, kinder transportees um, would be would be really interesting. Um, but I wanted to ask you also, because time is coming to an end and I want to open up the floor, tell us a little bit about your own background and whether your own uh, post memory, as it's called, you know, influenced your writing. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I guess I let it slip because I said that um, that Hanukkah's story reminds me very much of my own family in a lot of ways. And um, but I never, ever wanted my family story to intrude. The book is most definitely not about my family. And yet in another way, it was my attempt to understand my own mother. So my mother is an infant survivor. She was born on the 13th of July, 1944 in Budapest. Um, her father, my grandfather, was killed in Buchenwald, and my grandmother obviously also survived with this infant in the rubble in Budapest, and then um, immigrated to, came to Canada as refugees, my family came as refugees, um, after the Hungarian Revolution, so arriving in Canada in 1957. And one of the things I was, you know, you asked me earlier, Bea, and I forgot to say what, what was surprising in the research. There were so many surprising things, partly because I have to say, like, I do have my own family's experience. And the experience of so many of the children interviewed for the book or whose stories are in the book is actually really different from my own family's experience. And so that was so good for me, because I think sometimes you assume your family was like, oh, all Holocaust survivor families are like this, and it's not true. <laughs> but um, my family, a bit, a bit like what what Hanukkah is describing, my family did not like to talk about the past. Did d don't um, still don't really like to talk about it. My grandmother um, died a couple of years ago at almost one hundred and one, and it was only really in the last three or four years of her life that she decided that because I was a historian and because I was a historian of this topic, she could start to tell me about the past. And so we actually sat down with my iPad and I recorded, I don't know, dozens of hours of interviews with her, but she had spent all the rest of my life refusing to, to talk about it. And my mother still is very, you know, she would never ever call herself a child survivor. And she is still very reluctant to talk about this but I can actually announce that we are doing a joint event together in January, which a few years ago would have been unthinkable. I'm thrilled because she actually in lockdown, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but in lockdown, she's suddenly become very amenable to researching the past. And so she's been on Jewish Gen and Ancestry.com piecing together this huge family tree of our family who were murdered. And which we never had before because she didn't want to do it. Um, so we're, we're coming, we're getting there, I suppose, as a family. But it is and it isn't part of this book. My own family story is not in the book. But it was never, ever removed from my mind, obviously. And it has had an enormous influence on who I am. I didn't choose this topic by accident, I suppose. And one day, as I've, I've told uh, Bea already, one day, one day soon, I really want to write my own family story. I'm getting there. I, my editor joked one day, he said, I think you're writing a trilogy because I've got obviously this book and I've got two more coming down the pipe and the last one is a story about my own family. We'll get there. Okay, it sounds that that book needs to be written. 
Um, just the, the last question, because you mentioned that, and then we open the floor, is the term survivor. You said your mother wouldn't call herself a survivor. So is that also true for the child survivors? When did they become survivors? And you write about this very interestingly in your book. So I obviously that, in fact, look, I don't have the copy of the book in front of me. That was stupid. I should have had a copy in the room, but the title of the book is Survivors. And that was a very deliberate political choice on my part because so many of the, there we are, <laughs> survivors. Um, so many of the, of the child survivors in the book, <laughs> thanks, thanks. So many, oh my goodness, I'm seeing like a sea of my own book, which is really weird. Um, I lost the thread of my, my thought. So many of the children, children in the book did not feel that they could call themselves survivors for a terribly long time. And the historical moment at which that changes is in the 1980s and 90s. And we see the first em the kind of emergence of the term child survivor in the mid 80s or so. Um, that is a very difficult uh, term for many to embrace. Also very empowering when it, when it finally sort of comes into existence. I've got um, a, a child survivor who I, whose story is a bit like Jackie's. It's sort of a thread that goes through the book. Um, her name is Felice. And she was, she went along in 1983, there was the first ever American gathering of Jewish survivors of the Holocaust in Washington, DC, a huge, huge gathering of Holocaust survivors, the biggest that has ever taken place. Many tens of thousands of people were there. And she decided to go along. She felt very uncertain about whether she belonged or not. So keeping in mind, this is 1983. Now, the reason I know how she felt is because they had some roving reporters going around with like <laughs> like double real tape recorders, taping, like sort of going up to people and saying, are you a survivor? Tell me your life story. And she wasn't ready for this interview. She had never been interviewed. She subsequently gave many more interviews, but you can kind of feel the shock. And so you can hear these interviews. They're actually on the, um, I mean, anybody can listen to them. They're on the, um, they're in the archives of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and they're actually online. So they're really, really fascinating collection. But so you hear her kind of caught off guard. She's, I think she's 42 years old or something like that. So we're like, you know, which is my age. And she's, you can hear how hesitant she is about using this term. And then she says something like, I really didn't know if I should come here. You know, I, I'm not sure I'm a survivor. And actually some other camp survivors here are telling me I'm not because I survived in hiding. But then, well, hold on a minute though. I mean, the only people in my whole family who survived were me and my sister. If I'm not a survivor, what am I? And I just, love that because you can all it's like you can almost hear her thought process as she realizes hold on a second why don't I have the right to call myself a survivor if I'm the I'm almost the only one left then in subsequent interviews you she talks about coming to terms with that idea and, and accepting that she had a right to call herself a survivor one of the things that I was very surprised at um, in researching this book was how many child survivors told me that they were told through their whole childhoods and much of their lives that they were the lucky ones to the point you keep just hearing it again and again the lucky ones the lucky ones and how actually how dismissive a term that is in many ways because it it dismisses the the pain right I'm saying oh no come on you were lucky to survive and how hard it is to call yourself a survivor when you're always being told no 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 you're a lucky one and so actually, I think many child survivors had to go through a process of letting go of that idea. I was a lucky one say, actually, no, I'm a survivor. And that took a long time and it happened in a context. Um, and, and, and yet there are many like my mother who still, who still wouldn't want to use the term. Thank you, Rebecca. So much food for thought and the lucky ones. You know, if, you, if I think of all my interviews, so many people say that, you know, we were the lucky ones and what does that mean? And, Anyway, I, I think there's so much discussed there. I have many more questions, but um, you know, I think everyone should read this book. And I just want to, before we start, really congratulate you on your achievement and really also on behalf of everyone, really for your passion. Uh, and we're looking forward to, to more books from you. So first of all, thank you so much for writing this book, really a, an, an eye-opener and, and wonderful achievement. Now, 
Thank you. Um, let's open the floor. We have about sort of 10, 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, we've got a couple of, of uh, just, well, they're not really questions, but just things I'll read out from the chat. So first of all, Michael Sharp wants to know if Jackie's memoir is available to purchase. Um, Jackie, I know you're muted. I know you've written to me at AJR because uh, you've written your memoir, but it's not, you're muted, we can't hear you. Oh, I think I need to ask you to unmute yourself. Sorry. There you go. Uh, if you Google my name, uh, Jackie Young, J-A-C-K-I-E-Y-O-U-N-G, Holocaust, it tells more or less, or you can put lost and waiting to be found. That is the title of my memoir, which is almost totally complete. And it really does show you what a child survivor goes through sometimes. Okay, lovely. Thank you. And uh, Joan has also, um, Joan, do you want to say your own comment? Here you go. Where's Joan? Where's Joan? Yeah, I just wanted to say how to thank Rebecca for giving us the space to tell our stories. Too many so-called researchers, they come with a list of questions, most of which have got absolutely nothing to do with our experience. And that's as far as their vision. And Rebecca did not project onto us, even though she had her own family story. She listened to us, which I think, Rebecca, you should do train researchers nowadays because so many of them just have no idea what they're doing. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Joan. You're st Joan was one of the first people I interviewed and, you know, it just, Joan and Joanna, who are both here, I think, they were the first two I interviewed back in October 2014 and literally one of the most eye-opening experiences of my life. And I just have a lovely memory of sitting in Joan's house with her as it got dark outside and we just had more and more and more things to talk about. But this, you know, this method of interviewing, I'm not gonna, I feel like I do train obviously students at the university uh, at Swansea. Um, but I feel it's a very simple method because my method is, please tell me the story of your life over to you <laughs> without questions, only the questions that occur to me as you talk. And I think um, as Bea was suggesting earlier that some of these, I, I didn't tell you that I, I did interviews. So I, did, um, I didn't do that many. I only did 22 or 23, some in Britain and some in the United States and maybe a couple in Canada too, I can't remember. But I used interviews from other collections. So there are collections like the Shoah Foundation collection. I used the Fortunoff collection, collection at the Imperial War Museum. Uh, I used uh, Refugee Voices. I used uh, The Girls, which is um, a little collection of uh, interviews with uh, girls who came over to Britain in the um, summer of 1945. I used the Judith Kessenberg collection, which is, is um, housed in Israel. And all of those collections had their own approach to interviewing. And certainly the older ones often used questionnaires as you're suggesting, Joan. And all of you who are child survivors know just how awful an experience of a questionnaire can be. Because, um, and I'm sorry actually that uh, Zenka isn't here because she's very good at describing just how terrible that is when you're relentlessly asked questions. Tell me about your mother. Tell me about your father. Tell me about the curtains in your bedroom. And you can't remember any of that stuff. And each question just exposes. It's very exposing, right? Because it, it brings home how terrible it is that you don't know. And it makes you feel humiliated that you don't know. And it's not your fault. And so I would never use questionnaires. But um, we find them in many older interviewing styles because they come kind of informed by socio sociological practice. And I think there's very good reasons to abandon them. But for Rebecca, us. isn't it, that's also connected to the whole emergence of this whole notion of testimony. And that in fact, when you know oral history had to defend itself and they wanted to, at the beginning, at least say, it's not about memory, it's really about facts and so forth. So it, it's, it, it certainly has to do something at the, with Holocaust denial that Yes, our foundation was looking for all the details and all the cities and all the spellings, you know, and I think that has shifted now, but, you know, we need to, I think, contextualize that. 
It's one of the reasons I do have a chapter where I talk about this in the book. The reason I don't like to use the term testimony. Yeah. Because testimony has a juridical, it comes from a juridical context and it has sort of legal implications that seem to suggest that you tell a factual narrative and a chronological order. And so many child survivors couldn't do that when they were first interviewed in the 1980s or 90s, still can't do it now. And I think using the term oral history is, is a much more open one. So it's the, it's the term I prefer because yeah, that suggests a, a conversation between people who care. Uh, and I think of, that's my starting, starting point, really. It's a conversation. It's something we build together as we talk. I, I hope that's our approach in Refugee Voices as well. Um, but anyway, are there more? Thank you, Rebecca. Are there more questions? Yeah, we've got, well, Jacqueline Hobson just wanted to say, um, to thank you for an impressive book, including an explanation of how oral history can work so effectively. It was interesting to note the differences between case notes and freely given information. Uh, Eva Clark wants to know if she met you. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> In, in Swansea. Okay, so there we go. And now we have Cheryl. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute. You've got your hand up. Um, yes. Hi, okay. Cheryl. All right. Uh, th thank you very much, Rebecca. And um, I have such profound respect for the people who went through so much pain. My question is, Rebecca, did you come across any anyone of the survivors who used or tried regressive hypnotherapy, hypnosis? And if so, was the conclusion that they felt more enlightened or, or more disadvantaged after it, after the session? Did it bring up too many bad memories or did it help? some people to feel more at peace? That is a fabulous question. Thank you, Cheryl. I actually do write about that in the book, not at a great length, um, but I write about it a bit because when I listen to interviews from the 19, late 80s and early 90s, which was a time when um, regressive, regressive hypnotherapy was very popular, especially in the United States. There are many child survivors who describe their frustration at thinking, being so certain that they could actually fill in those gaps in their memory by going through hypnosis and it didn't work for a single one of them. The reason I think is quite clear, it's because we, I am not an expert on child developmental psychology, certainly, but I read about it as part of this book. I really enjoyed that reading. And there is a great mystery in the human brain. And it's the mystery, well, many. There's one of, the, one of the many mysteries of the human brain is the um, existence of something called infantile amnesia. So none of us remember, no matter what kind of childhood we had, none of us remember our first three years. It varies a little bit in different cultures, but it's more or less your first three years are invisible to you. You fill them in because you then later have conversations with your parents and they fill in the gaps or you see pictures or you have stories told to you. So sometimes we think we can remember those early years, but uh, it's been kind of shown in, in clinical experiments that we can't. So I, that was actually one of the things that I, I thought, okay, well, if, if we understand then that we the, that early world of memories a social construction right like it, we we know what happened in our early years not because we remember it directly but because our parents told us about that or our siblings told us about that and if you're a holocaust survivor a, a child survivor and you've lost that social world of memory you've probably lost access to those memories forever and no amount of therapy will allow you to bring them back again because they fall in that in that world of, of infantile, infantile amnesia that none of us really have access to. And I think there's a further complication for child survivors and it's the issue of language. So there's some been some fascinating research, actually interestingly also in the 80s and 90s on how children remember. And um, there's a really amazing psychologist in the United States named Robin Fibish, and she found that there's, there's 
she theorized that there's two things that allow us to hold on to our memories. And this is the reason why young children don't. So the first one is language acquisition. And the second one is learning how to tell the story of yourself, the practice of autobiographical narrative. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a mother and father around to teach you how to tell the story of yourself, you won't be able to remember. And if you keep switching languages, which happens to so many child Holocaust survivors as they move from Yiddish to German to English or what you, you know, to French, they're switching these European languages, they're through casting off the old ones and learning new ones. That impinges upon your ability to remember. And so I think in that period when hypnotherapy was quite popular, um, late 80s, early 90s, so many child survivors tried it with enormous frustration. It doesn't work to access memories that cannot really be accessed. I've never ever encountered anyone who spoke positively of it, I'm afraid to say. Maybe if it was um, an effort to, to kind of explore memories that are there, but they're kind of like you have a sense of them, but you, you, they're a little blocked, it might be a little different, but to fill in the absolutely impenetrable gaps, it, it doesn't work. And I think a lot of um, child survivors felt very disappointed that it didn't work, frustrated that it didn't work. I wish I could tell you one example of somebody who said that really helped, but I, I can't. On the other hand, many people did say that having a chance to talk about their past does help. Talk about their past in a way that respects the absences and the gaps that cannot be filled in. That's a different thing, I think, entirely. Um, I can see Bea wants to say something. No, I just want to add something to this, which I find always puzzling, that it's also an, uh, depends on the individual. I mean, yeah. some people have memories from when they're five and six, and I certainly interviewed some, and some don't, yeah. and some older children don't. So it's a, such an interesting um, field, isn't it? Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, well, there's one more comment. Um, said um i have sorry i don't understand the big from oh i don't know sorry <laughs> um i have a friend called hanukkah also born in hiding in the netherlands she does not remember names because when she was a child her parents always told her not to remember names mm -hmm. because if they were captured she wouldn't have been able to reveal the names of people who helped them mm -hmm. so that's another and um, it's also very interesting. I know um, my mother wanted to have, at one point was thinking of having some sort of hypnosis mm -hmm. to try and help her remember and she never went through it. So I'm actually quite pleased to hear that it, that it didn't work because she would have just been disappointed. So anyway, I think we're nearly finished, Bea. Um, yeah, any more, any, there's somebody, Vera, you've got a question? No, no question. Um, just, if nobody has a question, I just, one last question I want to ask you because a wonderful thing which comes out in the book is this whole notion of agency um, and we didn't talk about it and you you are sort of arguing that the children had more agency than we kind of uh, gave to them and that's something I feel very much also in some of the Refugee Voices interviews I'm thinking of a lady called Betty Bloom who describes for example that her sister and herself went by themselves on the kinder transport. They told the mother they couldn't get places. They told the mother there is a train going, please buy a ticket. And they smuggled themselves onto a train themselves. Uh, and I feel you also talk about it. You, you hinted at that where you said somebody lied uh, about the mother because they wanted to get to Canada. And I think that's just a wonderful aspect of your book. Maybe we can uh, conclude with that, Rebecca. Look, I, uh, I guess I talked a little bit about my family of origins, but what I didn't tell you about is the family I've created. And I have two children. They're downstairs, possibly having a fight right now, sitting on the sofa. They're seven and 10. So they have lived with me all through the writing of this book, right? My daughter was one year old when I, when I came to interview you, Joan, and you, Joanna. Um, she was not, not, even, not even one, I think, at that point. So I've also watched my own children grow through this. And 
uh, anybody who has ever watched children grow knows that children have a lot of agency, right? They have their own ideas. They can be very subversive about getting what they want. They have ways of dealing with adult pressures. And I thought, well, surely this is exactly the same for child survivors. And sure enough, it just became blatantly clear as I looked at archival documents, that children are very, very good at being subversive especially when adults are trying to get them to do different things. And um, I, um, Bea mentioned that, that the story I told before of the boy who lied. I thought that was an incredible act of agency, right? He, he, I mean, he might've talked about it with his mother, but he took the initiative to concoct this whole completely made up story to get himself and his mother out of a DP camp and on to Canada. And I think it's one of the wonderful things that, I mean, I told you I'm, I'm planning on writing more about child survivors and more about children. And I think this is something historians have, they're cottoning on to now, but broadly in the past, historians haven't been very good at writing about children as human beings and as agents and historical actors in their own right. And that situation is changing. I'm not the only one who's, who's doing it. But I think that's the way forwards. We write about children as people who have their own, um, <clears throat> excuse me, their own desires and their own fears and their own, um, you know, agendas and opinions. And uh, that's going to give us a really different picture of, of this story and frankly, of all stories. Okay, great. Thank so you. One, sorry, one last comment from Barbara Dresner who said, um, Many second generation children are afraid to ask their parents about their history. So could the attendees think about that, please? So the not knowing that can be passed on. Okay. <laughs> That's another field, isn't it? About second generation <laughs> to ask and what not to ask and sensitivities and silence and, you know, much more to think about. Maybe we do another, we have another session on that one. <laughs> I think in the meantime, just to really uh, thank you all for coming uh, tonight, this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Jackie, for sharing your story, Rebecca, for your presenting or answering some of the questions. And I really hope um, everyone will get the chance to read your book. Um, and really just to say happy Hanukkah, happy festive season, and very nice to see you and um, see you again soon. And thank you, Deborah, for all your... Yeah, pleasure. Yes, and thank you, AJR, for setting this up. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank everyone. You. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.